Uh, well, good morning. Um, can I add my welcome to the ones you've already received? My name is Mike, and as Sam uh, mentioned, it's my it's been my privilege really uh, to to kick off um, yeah my journey with you guys this year as community pastor. Uh, so I thought uh, we would uh, just kick off with a couple of community uh, some community news and a community challenge. Uh, who's ready? It's good news. Who's ready for the community news? Yeah, awesome. Uh, well, uh, last weekend, we had two couples uh, get married. Uh, amazing timing. So put your hands together for James and Suzette Moran and Jordan and Natalia Reem, who are down the front. Yeah. So come congratulate them uh, afterwards. Uh, amazing. So good. So God's timing. Praise God. This weekend would have been a challenge to get married. Um, but um, hey, what about the challenge? Who's ready for the challenge? Yeah, some of us are. You're like, well, what's this challenge? Um, well, if you've been around us for a little while, you'll, you'll notice here on a hill, we, we're not just one church. We're actually eight churches across Australia. And we're all looking at Exodus at the moment. Exodus is a story um, of freedom. Uh, looking, actually, we're about to embark on Israel in the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, and what we thought, some of the pastors, we got together and we thought, why don't we have a challenge of 40 days? Uh, 40 days of freedom, we're calling it. And so a few of us uh, from the different churches, myself included, have put together this book. Um, called 40 Days of Freedom. And there's three big challenges. Um, you don't have to do them all. But firstly, just getting into the Bible. Uh, maybe uh, you don't have a regular kind of Bible reading pattern. This could be an opportunity for, to start or, or restart that. Uh, there's a bunch of kind of readings and questions to kind of help you get into Exodus. Uh, and the cool thing is it, it's 40 days, but it goes over eight weeks. So uh, if you do the maths, it's only five per week. So you can have a couple of days off, uh, which is nice. Um, so really helpful, just take you 15 minutes or so each day to get into there. But second one uh, is prayer. Uh, we've been talking about praying for our 3 two, one friends this year, praying for three friends that don't yet know Jesus for two minutes once a week. The challenge uh, for 40 days is, could you pray every day, just for a minute, one o'clock, um, pray for those friends, uh, they would come to know Jesus and pray for their well-being as well. And thirdly, fasting. Now, fasting, it's a physical act with spiritual focus. And in fasting, we, we voluntarily choose to, to give something up uh, so that God might fill that space left behind. You know, over the next eight weeks, uh, maybe you might choose to, to fast uh, from food. Don't, don't take eight weeks off food, but maybe you skip a meal a week. Uh, maybe you cut out so some social media from your phone or Netflix or whatever it is, something that perhaps God could fill that space. You could use that time to, to draw near to God and his people. Um, as well, uh, there's also a bunch of weekly challenges like going for a walk with someone, like making something, uh, even singing. Uh, it's all outlined here. Uh, our team at the door will, will give them out to you. If you like, love you to, to consider uh, picking one up. And maybe it could be something you do with your gospel community, with your family, with your friends. Um, I really, I'm really looking forward to it. It's really practical. Um, um, it looks beautiful. I, didn't, I had no part in designing it. But um, yeah, I'm really thankful that we've got this. There is a digital version as well, which we can make available too. Uh, so that's a challenge. Uh, but let me pray. Uh, I'm going to pray as we look at uh, the Ten Commandments. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you that you speak to us through it. And I pray now that through your Holy Spirit, you would speak so that you change our hearts to make us more like Jesus. Help me to be clear, faithful, and helpful. And may our minds and our ears be attentive. But above all, would you get the glory and the praise and the honor? And all God's people said, Amen. Uh, well, uh, this month marks uh, the three-year anniversary of, uh, of my grandma's death. She lived to over 100, 101 actually. We used to call her Bupcha. It's kind of Polish for, for grandma. And you know, the last few years of her life, she sort of just had like three or four stories on repeat so what happens when you get old, you kind of tell the same story. One of the stories she told was um, she, w she went to Amy Insurance uh, to you know, get her car insurance. And she said, uh, she said, you know, if only, she said to the guy behind the desk, if only people would obey, obey the Ten Commandments, uh, then we wouldn't need insurance. She said, the guy's like, whatever, I don't believe in God. He then proceeds to, you know, drop the insurance papers, stub his toe, and he's like, oh, my God. And Bupcha's like, I thought you said you don't believe in God. <laughs> That was a joke she told. Um, but for a previous generation, for Bupcha's generation, uh, whether you're a Christian or not, the Ten Commandments, they, they were widely known. Uh, they're probably one of the most well-known parts of the Old Testament. 
You know, they'd be studied and recited in schools. They'd be kind of mounted on walls in churches and even in places like Parliament. The Ten Commandments, they in fact underpin uh, the, the very fabric of our Western morality. Atheist, atheist historian uh, Tom Holland, he, he studied the impact of the Bible on our culture. And he says this, uh, looking at the law and, it's, and the Ten Commandments, which is really the center of the law, uh, he says this, this is, it is why that we generally assume that every human life is of equal value. In my morals and ethics, I've learned to accept that I'm not Greek or Roman, I'm not influenced by them, but thoroughly and proudly Christian. Ten Commandments. It's hard to argue that they haven't had a profound impact on our society. And as we work through our, our series in Exodus, it's called a story of freedom. We're going to see actually how these commands offer us freedom. You know, Kevin DeYoung, he writes a really excellent short little book on the Ten Commandments. Uh, he says the Ten Commandments are not prison bars, but traffic laws uh, set to help humanity flourish. And so as we, where are we up to in the story? Last week we saw uh, in Exodus 19, uh, if you have your Bible, keep, keep that open. Uh, keep that open in verse 6 of Exodus 19. We see that God's people are to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. They're meant to show who God is and what he's like to the world. And in chapter, um, chapter 20, as we get to today, uh, we're at Mount Sinai. And we see that God reveals the law. Uh, the code to his people. But this is 3,000 years ago. Uh, so how are, we, how are we meant to approach the Ten Commandments today? Well, let me start by kind of doing a bit of Mythbusters. Uh, let me start with three things, what the Ten Commandments are not. Firstly, they're not a checklist that makes you right with God. You know, when I was younger, I used to think being a Christian was about just ticking a bunch of boxes, climbing a ladder to make you right with God. That if you were good enough, if you passed the test, uh, then you could be friends with him. You could get to heaven. Uh, the Christian message is, is not that at all. Uh, the Christian message is that the only way you are right with God is through Jesus. So we all fail to even live up to our own standards, let alone God's. Uh, no one is worthy except for Jesus. And he died in our place on the cross so that by believing in him, we can have life to his name. Ten Commandments are not a, bu- a, bu- a bunch of boxes that we tick uh, to make us right with God. But secondly, nor are they the way that Israel is right with God as well. Uh, if you have a Bible, open up to 20 verse, chapter 20, verse 2. Uh, God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of, sl- of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God, he, he saved Christians before they are to obey. But here we see God... He saved Israel out of Egypt. And then he proceeds to give them the law. It's not the other way around. God saves and then he speaks. And he saves them, as we saw this last week, not because they're more moral than others. You know, Stephen was saying that you know, if Israel were like, you know, kind of a kid at school that you pick for a cricket team, you'd pick Israel last, right? There's nothing special about them as well. But God, he, continue, he offers grace to them. And this concept of grace, which just means undeserved gift, it's present not just in the New Testament, but all throughout the Old Testament. God, in his kindness, he chooses to bless his people Israel, not because of what they do. In fact, as we keep reading in Exodus, it's just one big stuff-up story of of Israel. And and in fact, the Ten Commandments, they they specifically violate most of them uh, just in this book alone. Yet God, he, he pursues them. He shows favor on them time and time again, despite their disobedience to the law, despite them breaking the Ten Commandments. And so it's not the way that Israel are right with God. But thirdly, the, here's the third myth, that the, the Ten Commandments, they're not outdated because of Jesus. You know, there's a popular teaching that, that's kind of on the rise that oh, because of grace, because of Jesus, we can sort of disregard the Old Testament. Like that's no longer relevant for us. Uh, there's a, a pastor of a mega church in America called Andy Stanley. He wrote a book called Irresistible. And he says this. He says, the Ten Commandments have no authority over you. None. To be clear, thou shall not obey the Ten Commandments. You can buy his book on, at Kurong down the road. Friends, this is heresy. This is wrong. This is false teaching. This is not what the Bible says. We have to sit under this 
because it comes from God. Jesus, he did not come to abolish the law. He and Paul, they repeated, in fact, nine of the Ten Commandments verbatim. And, and in fact, uh, there's multiple points in the, in the New Testament that the Ten Commandments are, are summarized. In Mark 10, Romans 9, 1 Timothy 1, we need to hear these Ten Commandments because, first and foremost, because they show us who God is. They show us what he is like. And then they show us how we are to live in response to this. If you're new to, to Christian faith, if you've been checking things out with us, can I extend that welcome, especially warm welcome uh, to you? Hey, here's four words that summarize the Ten Commandments and indeed the entire message of the Bible. Ready for four words? Who's ready for four words? Yeah, awesome. Love God, love others. Four words. Love God, love others. Not because this is the way that we are saved, but this is the way that we are to live in response to to how God has loved us, specifically through Jesus. So as we look at this chapter, the Ten Commandments, we'll see that this is how God wants us to live, loving God, loving others in response to what he has done. So firstly, love God. What's the first step to loving someone? Well, let's get to know them. My old pastor, uh, he, um, he had a bit of a honeymoon fail. He, he organized a surprise honeymoon for his wife, He's like, you know what? I'm going to go to off the Great Barrier Reef to Heron Island. You know, this, this place filled with tropical birds, beaches, amazing. That's why they call it Heron because the bird, and they get hundreds of thousands of birds come and breed there and, and every year. He discovered two things about his wife, um, his new wife during, uh, during that honeymoon. Firstly, she hates birds. <laughs> and secondly, she doesn't even like the beach. <laughs> Epic fail of a surprise honeymoon. We need to know someone before we can love them. Knowing God, it's key. It's the key command for our lives. J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, really excellent read if you haven't read it, uh, he says that there's a difference between knowing God and knowing about God. When you truly know God, you have energy to serve Him, boldness to share Him, and contentment in Him. So how do we know God? Well, it's through this. This is how God speaks to us. This is how we know what is God is like. We don't need to speculate or to kind of sum up some kind of divine force or vibe. No, no. God has revealed himself through his word. And so bring your Bible to church because this is how God speaks to us. We're going to be jumping around um, and uh, you know, flicking at different passages and it's good to see things in context specifically. If you don't own a Bible, we'd love to bless you with one. Come chat to our team at the info desk. Uh, but here in Exodus, uh, we've been seeing God speak uh, throughout and, and God, he speaks through Moses, he speaks through Aaron and, and they relay that message to the people. But here, there's a unique moment where the people are gathered uh, under Mount Sinai and God speaks to them. This is in an audible voice. This is the only moment when that happens throughout Exodus. And we need to listen, not just because of what God says, but how God says it. Now, tone, it's 95% of communication, something like that. Tone is everything. And check out the tone. If you have a Bible, flick back to 19 uh, verse 18. Now, when all the people saw thunder... And flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, whoops, I'm in chapter 20, but that's all right. <laughs> they said to Moses, you speak to us, lest, uh, do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to put you to the test that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. And the people stood far off while Moses drew near to, to the thick darkness where God was. And back in, it's the same thing, but back in chapter 19, uh, verse 18 again, um, now, sounds similar. <laughs> now Mount Sinai, Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And at the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. A fearsome tone, right, from God. To be there, to be in that, that, the presence of God, hearing him speak like that. We need to listen. God's people, it's a wake-up call for them. 
but for us as well. We need to listen to not just what God is saying, but, but how he is saying. We need to take his commands seriously. But he's also our rescuer and saviour. Check out again chapter 20, verse 2. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. This is key. The same God who saves, he speaks. This is God who is the saviour. He's the redeemer of God's people from slavery. And for Christians, he's, he's the, the saviour of us from sin. You know, that, that verse, verse 2, is so significant that some denominations even call that the first commandment. He hasn't even commanded anything yet. He just said who he is. But as we look at the next four, next four commandments, they specifically show us how we are to relate to God, how we are to love God, because they show us who God is. So let's check out these first four commandments. I'm going to move through um, all ten pretty quickly. You know, there's been whole sermons that go for an hour or more just on each commandment. I'm not going to do that. We're going to move through it quite quickly. But as we do that, we're going to see what it looks like to love God and love others. So here's the first couple. Uh, check out verse 3. God says, you shall, no, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or the earth beneath, or is it in the water under the earth? You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I am the Lord, I am a jealous God. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. God's clear here. Don't worship other gods. Or don't even make stuff and worship them. You know, back for ancient Israel, kind of religion, spirituality, it was a bit like a buffet table. There were lots and lots of gods um, out there. You could sort of pick and choose. And you know, if you didn't like them, you could just kind of build your own god and bow down to that. Now, we're probably thinking, you know, that, that's pretty irrelevant for us today. You know, people aren't kind of bowing down to statues and things like that. But if you, if you stop and think about our context today, is spirituality, is it really that different? We worship idols too. Worship, it, does, it means giving something ultimate worth. Giving something ultimate worth. And an idol, it's, it could be anything, that, even a good thing, that you make a God thing. Something that dominates your mind. You know, what is it that commands your attention, your time, or your money, or your web browsing history? You know, maybe it's something that's even occupying your mind at church, even this morning. I know I've been there before. What are the things in your life that you look for to give you ultimate satisfaction and purpose? Maybe it's your image, your career. Maybe it's your marriage, your family, or your desire to have one. It could be a hobby. And again, these things aren't bad things. They're good things. But has it taken the place of God? For me, all those I've just listed have been idols in my life at different seasons. What is the idol for you at the moment, or idols? God is saying He is the only true God. Worshipping other stuff, it's dumb, it's futile. We need to repent. What do we learn about God here? When well, verse 5, He says, I am the Lord your God, I am a jealous God. Jealous? Is God in this toxic relationship with His people? Is God envious of other gods? Well, no, he, he knows that other gods aren't real, but jealousy. Now think about it. Imagine if my wife, Sarah, imagine if she just went around and started kissing other men. I'd have every right to be angry and jealous. I am her one true husband. She's my one true wife. That affection we have is reserved for us, for that covenant of marriage. God, he's jealous when you put other things before him. He's not just the one that made you. He's, he's the one that made the things that you're worshipping. And he is the only one worthy of worship. He makes it even clearer what he is like in, in uh, verse 7, in the third commandment. Come with me. He says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will hold him, not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. When God revealed himself uh, to Moses back in Exodus chapter 3, uh, if you remember, he gave Moses his personal name, Yahweh, where you see in the Old Testament, capital L-O-R-D. It literally means, I am who I am. There's nothing that you can compare to him. 
He is. The prophet Isaiah in, in chapter 40, I was reading it this week, he says, how can you compare God to anything? To him, the nations are like a drop in the bucket. America, China, India, Russia, just like a drop in the bucket. He says the islands are like fine dust. The island of Australia, like fine dust to God. Who can we compare him to? No one is worthy of worship but him. Therefore, his name matters. And classically, this command, it's been taken to not use God's name as a swear word. You know, don't, use, don't misuse God's name. Don't use it as a swear word. Look, that's part of it. If you're a Christian and you're saying Jesus Christ as a swear word, if you're um, saying, oh my God, like, that's, that's not an appropriate thing to do. That, that's misusing God's name. But the command is far bigger than that. The command literally means don't empty his name. Don't diminish the name, the reputation of God in your life. Another way of looking at it is don't drag his name, his honor, through the mud. For Israel, they were meant to be a light to the nations who were meant to show the world what God is like. But so often the nations, they laughed at God because they laughed at how pathetic Israel were. They didn't practice what they preached. They didn't even preach what they were meant to preach. And so for us today as Christians, how we live, how we conduct ourselves, it matters because, because we're representatives of God. His name is at stake. And we have an even more intimate relationship than Israel did with God. If you're a Christian, it means you've been united with Christ. It means you've got God's personal Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. We are to be honoring him, his name, not just with our lips, but with our lives. Fourth commandment, it shows us, again, what God is like. And it shows us that we as image bearers of him, are to be like God. Check out verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor, do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore... The Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. God is telling his people, be like me. I made the world in six days. I rested. I want you to rest. I actually want to give you what I've made to enjoy. I want you to, to trust in my provision for you. You don't need to squeeze an extra buck out of the week. Stop. Rest. But, but more than that, the Sabbath isn't just about doing nothing. It was actually about clearing out space in your day, in your week, to worship God and to be with his people. The question you might be asking is, are we under the Sabbath? Do, do we have to keep it? Friends, that's, that's probably the wrong question to ask. A better question for us might be, what does it look like for me to rest and create space to worship God each week? You know, Because of this verse, Western civilization largely has had Sunday off. Now, things are changing, of course, and some of us, because of our circumstances, have to work on Sunday. Are you sinning when you do this? No, I don't think so. Uh, but I'm encouraged. I know a bunch of you guys have, have chatted with your bosses and, and, and said, hey, I can't work Sundays. I'm really encouraged by that. But the principle here is set, is that God is setting up for his people is to come together and worship him, to enjoy time together, to stop and give thanks to him. And so we have church uh, every week as a rhythm uh, to do that. I'm, I'm super thankful that, that we can, you know, the announcement midday yesterday. I'm super thankful that we can actually do that in the flesh. Uh, I know a bunch of you guys are online. Hey, welcome. Good to have you guys with us as well. But so good that we can be here. You know, we can go out for lunch afterwards. I encourage you, go out for lunch. You can take off your mask when you sit down and, and enjoy time with his people. God has made us to do that. Do you have weekly rhythms? of slowing down, of stopping, of clearing out space in your week, switching off your email from work, even stopping doing life admin, paying bills, things like that, where you can stop doing and just be. Do you prioritize gathering here with God's people? What excuses do you make for not being here? 
Look, there are good reasons for not coming along on a Sunday, and COVID's sort of shown that. You know, even my daughter, she threw up last night, and um, she's no other symptoms. But look, we as a family, like Sarah and my girls, just started to stay home. You know, no COVID symptoms. Like, there's there's good reasons to to, to stay home. Um, but God knows your heart. What excuses do you make for not gathering with God's people? It's a way of showing that we love God. By gathering with his people to give thanks, to praise, to worship him. So the first four commandments, they outline our relationship with God. They show us who God is, set down some foundations of what it is like to love him. Avoid idols, misuse his name, don't misuse his name, and having this weekly pattern of worship. But the second six commands, they're related. You know, when Jesus is asked by a teacher of the law in Matthew, Matthew 22, he says, what's the greatest commandment? He says that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Of these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Jesus is saying the whole Old Testament Really hang off these two commands, to love God and to love others. They're related. You see, once we understand who God is and what He's done and the incredible love He's shown us, specifically through Jesus, once we get that, we can't help but overflow with love and thanksgiving and loving others. But, you know, because we're idiots... We need it spelt out for us. We need it repeated time and time again all throughout the Bible. Jesus and Paul, he repeats these commands of loving others. But they show a pattern, a summary of what it looks like for us to love others. As image bearers of God, we are humans. Everyone is an image bearer of God. What does it look like to love others, to love the people that God has made? Fifth commandment, verse 12. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Love your mum and dad. Honor them. Respect them. Listen to them. This is the first commandment that God gives with a promise that if you do this, things will work out for you. I sort of wish that my my two-year-old got this commandment a bit better. I say to her, look, standing in your high chair, it's probably not going to work out well for you. Yep, see, I told you. But here we see the vision of God. We see his heart. We see his vision that humanity would be families that would be united in the promised land, living in loving communities. Later in Deuteronomy, we'll see expectations given upon parents to teach them about God and the commandments. But here, the onus is given to kids, to children, to love their parents Notice it's not just honouring them when they're good, when they're righteous. You know, the older you get, uh, the more you realise how flawed your parents are. Uh, that they're just like us. That they're sinful human beings. Um, you know, I've struggled with this personally uh, in the last few years uh, of honouring my parents. Uh, Mum, I know you're listening. You mightn't be watching. Uh, you love you. You regularly listen to these things, my sermons. Um, Sorry, I'm sorry for the ways that I've dishonored you. Uh, I'm not going to list all the names, all the things that I've done wrong, but you know them. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've failed to honor you. Those of us who are under 18 and those of us who are living in our parents' households, specifically, there's a word for us that God wants us to, to listen to our parents, to listen to the wisdom and the experience they have. He wants us to be honest with them. And if they're followers of Jesus, this is an incredible blessing and privilege that that you have. But note, it's not just a command to just blanket rule, submit to your parents at all costs universally. No, this command has sadly been twisted before by abusive parents. Parents, mums, dads, this is not a command to lord over your kids. This is not a command to lord over your kids. We as parents are to model gracious leadership to our children. To be like God, who's our loving Father. We're to be like Him in the way we lead sacrificially our children. Sixth command, verse 13. Do not murder. God, He's getting straight to the point here. The principle behind this command is the sanctity of human life. 
you know, you and I and nearly 8 billion people in this world, we're all created in God's image. We're all precious to God. You might be thinking, great, finally, here's one command that I can tick. I haven't killed anyone. Amazing. I've got some uh, bad news for you. If you remember back in Matthew 5, uh, the Sermon on the Mount series that we did earlier this year, if you're with us, Jesus, he exposes our hearts and and raises God's command on a higher plane. Jesus says uh, in Matthew 5 that you've heard it was said, do not murder, but I tell you, don't even be angry with someone. There's a lot more to say there. You can go back and listen to um, the, the series on our podcast. But the principle is the same. God, he, he doesn't want us just to tick boxes. The call is, in fact, to love our neighbor as ourself. So holding grudges, being hostile towards us, having this sense of entitlement, it's violating the sanctity of human life and equality that God has set up. God's vision for humanity is far bigger than just ticking a bunch of boxes. Next command, verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. Adultery, it's kind of a word that's sort of um, going out of favor uh, in our society. Well, here's one definition of adultery. Adultery is voluntary sexual intercourse between a married person and another person who is not his or her lawful spouse. You know, don't, don't do this, don't participate in this moment, but if, but if I asked you to raise your hand if you've committed adultery based on that definition, probably most of you wouldn't raise your hand. Like maybe a couple of you might. Most of us would keep our hands firmly by our sides. But again, Jesus, he's really helpful. He, he goes, digs deeper. It's not about box tipping, ticking. What Jesus says about this command um, in Matthew 5 again, you've heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus, he, he takes the heart of this command to expose our hearts, showing what it means to love our neighbors. He then raises the bar. He says, if you've ever looked at porn, if you've ever fantasized about someone sexually, about a man or a woman that isn't your spouse, if you've ever lingered on Instagram, you know, scrolled through someone's feed with lustful intent, if you ever Googled that particular search query, You've committed adultery in your heart. If I were to ask you that same question now, who's committed adultery? 99% of you would raise your hand. Other 1% of you, you'd be lying. God, he's not a killjoy here. God's given us the good gift of sex, but he's given us in a particular context. That is marriage. His vision here is for unity and faithfulness between marriage, that that relationship between man and woman that reflects the relationship between God and his people. But unless someone's your spouse, they're not yours to have. That man, that woman on the screen, they are made in the image of God. Their body is not an object for your your cravings. I'm going to jump to the ninth commandment. They'll wrap up 8 and 10 together. Uh, Nearly done. Verse 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Here we see two key attributes of God's character. He's a God of truth and a God of justice. Remember, this this law is written originally to Israel who didn't have a government system. They didn't have a constitution. This is really the building blocks for that. It'll continue to be established and unpacked throughout the Old Testament. But the point here is, is not to lie, to take advantage of your neighbor. It's, not to, it's to not misrepresent facts to improve your situation or to drag someone down. It's the same principle of loving others. Everyone deserves a fair trial. Lastly, uh, 8 and 10, in verse 15 to 18, I'll summarize it in this. Do not steal. Do not covet. Don't take things that aren't yours. Don't even envy them what others have. That's what coveting is. It's that jealousy of, of wanting what others have for yourself. You know, businesses, they, they really built their, their empires on the human propensity to covet. Instagram, it's a platform of coveting where people show off what they have, that their bodies, their experiences, their friends, their lives, that others might want that. You know, I used to work in marketing and, and so often it's about manufacturing a desire 
playing on the heartstrings of people, showing them what they think they need. Coveting. It's actually one of the biggest issues in the Western church. You know, often we, we would laugh about our online shopping addictions rather than weeping in repentance. We spent, we spent hours you know, strolling through pictures and not reading our Bibles. Many of us have bought into the lie that we must travel, we must have these experiences to be complete, to be human. It's our right of passage. But it's coveting. And so what's the antidote to coveting? Contentment. Again, you can go back out, out enjoy our, our sermon series called Enjoying God. Uh, check out Enjoying God in Plenty on our podcast. But friends, you are rich. Not just physically, materially you are rich, but even more than that, spiritually. God has given you everything you need. Ultimately, he's given you his son, Jesus. Jesus loves you. As I invite the band to, to come up, we see in Jesus a perfect model of what it means to love, to love others. John, in his first letter, he says this in John 1, 3, 16, 1 John 3.16. He says, this is, how we, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Jesus, he laid down his life for you. He died on the cross to take the place that you and I deserve. We don't have to keep all these commandments to be right with God, to pass some test. No, no, we've already failed that test, but there's one who hasn't. That's Jesus. Jesus doesn't say, if you obey my commandments, I will love you. No, instead, he washes the feet of his disciples and says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. God isn't trying to crush us with red tape and regulations. The Ten Commandments, they're not prison bars, but traffic laws to help us flourish. We need to sit under God's law as it shows us who God is and what it means to love. To love God and to love others. That's what we were made for. That's what we were saved for. I'm going to pray. But before I do, maybe you want to chat with someone off the back of what you've heard or what the back of this week has been for you. Maybe there's some sin in your life that you want to repent of. Maybe there's other things that are going on. We'd love to pray for you. Uh, normally, uh, during these songs, we'd have a prayer team in the middle. We're just going to not do that just this week because uh, of COVID. But I I'd love to pray with you, um, chat with me. You can come chat with our team at the info desk. You can go co slash bridge, fill out a connect card with some prayer requests. We'd love to be doing that. Chat with your gospel community as well. But why don't you join with me and pray? Dear Heavenly Father, your law shows us our need for a saviour. We can't keep your commands. And we are thankful for Jesus who did, who took our place on the cross. We ask though that you would give us the strength and the conviction this week to love you and to love others. And may we as a community spur each other on towards love and good deeds. And may that give you glory. In Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen.